and we are excited to have them here today to present our, our legislative update. Sorry about the delays getting in, but uh, Jim, Jordan, the floor right. is all right. yours. Well, thank you, uh, Jason. Appreciate that. And we certainly appreciate the chance we have to be here and the invitation of the trust to come and, and to talk to everyone about uh, different topics. And we're, we're happy to present today on the uh, 2016 legislative session. And so Jordan and I will be going over some of the bills, both that uh, passed and didn't pass, relating to land use and eminent domain law. So. So, in terms of how this session played out along the topics of land use and eminent domain, I think the general consensus is that there were not, you know, there weren't any bills that were major changes. Um, you know, for example, in eminent domain, there, there weren't any changes really. Uh, previous years, we've had some of those changes. And we've uh, updated folks on that, and we're happy to, to speak to anyone that, that has questions about may, what may have happened in previous sessions. But this session, eminent domain, not anything to talk about. Land use, uh, at least on the government side, what we've heard from, from some folks is that they felt like this was the session of uh, death by a thousand cuts. Uh, that, that sentiment was expressed a few times, uh, you know, again, on, on the government side, where there wasn't any major revision to uh, LUDMA or other land use uh, provisions, but there were lots of bills that ended up um, impacting land use and, and restricting various uh, abilities of, of uh, governments or, or um, land use authorities on regulating land use in their jurisdictions. Um, you know, as, as we go through this, you know, we're going to go over the past bills, spend a little more time on them. And then we will also uh, do a summary of failed bills that are in the topic of land use or that we think would be of interest uh, to you. And some of those bills are going to be coming back. And so we'll, we'll touch on those uh, as, we, as we go along. And of course, as usual as we do this, if there's any questions that you have as we go along, don't hesitate to let us know. Um, Brent will help us out, and maybe Jason, someone who can read the screen. Maybe Jordan has better eyesight than I do. I don't know, but um, we're happy to happy to uh, address those questions as we go along um, to the best of our ability. So, um, any anything to add, Jordan? Any joke? No jokes. Okay. Not, not yet. All right. <laughs> oh, good. So we'll uh, we'll see what Jordan. No, I don't. I don't have anything. Okay. <laughs> Backtracking a little bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and jump into the um, the actual bills that passed here. All right, so the first one we'll talk about that hopefully will be of interest to local governments um, is House Bill 161, Agricultural Parcel Amendments. This was sponsored by Mike McKell, um, and like with any, well, like with several bills, this one, as we understand, it has a story behind it. Um, uh, specifically down in southern Utah County, I believe it was kind of the Palmyra area, there was a gentleman who owned a 50-acre parcel. Most of it was, was farmed in alfalfa, but there was a farmhouse as well. And he was to the point where he didn't need the home anymore. He wanted to sell it off, but continue farming the agricultural piece. Uh, when he went to Utah County to do that, um, they said, yeah, you can cut this off. You can do a two-lot subdivision with, you know, one lot in the house and then the remaining 49 acre or one acre in the house and the remaining 49 acres you can keep in agricultural but you have to subdivide the property and in doing so uh, the county subdivision standards would have required him to move a ditch three feet and also probably move an agricultural building which would have been very costly the ditch alone would have been upwards of thirty thousand dollars or something like that um, so that's what as we understand it produced uh, the concern related to this bill. Um, the county, they were willing to go ahead and exempt him, but they didn't feel like they had state authority from LUDMA to do so. Uh, so that's why we have this bill. Um, what the bill does is it allows uh, exemption from platting requirements for essentially that specific type of situation where you have a farmhouse on a large agricultural piece, you want to subdivide off that part of that uh, 
home and sell it off and, and continue to farm the agricultural piece. Um, but nothing's really changing on the ground, so why does it make sense to have them do additional improvements at this point? Uh, I think that's kind of the justification and reasoning behind um, the amendment. And so uh, it passed. Keep in mind that this only applies to counties. So this provision is only in the county LUDMA. It's not in the one for municipalities. Arguably, um, under a different exception in the uh, subdivision ordinance, you could potentially already do something like this. Um, but this clarifies and, and explicitly states that that can be done. Also keep in mind that it's a may, the provision allowing it, counties may enact this type of an ordinance. Um, so in other words, they're not required to allow exemption from platting requirements for these types of situations, but they may pass ordinances or an ordinance that allows an exemption for this type of a situation. So that's that. Anything to add, Jim? Nope. So HB 223, the local historic district amendments, was certainly one of the bills that had uh, some media attention and generated a little controversy here during the session. Um, this particular bill applies to municipalities that have, or, or any historic district that is owner initiated. So to our knowledge, this basically applies to Salt Lake City. Um, and I know that uh, there's certainly you know, people who, who express a sentiment that uh, this is the legislature uh, micromanaging what local jurisdictions do and how they, they decide to run their land use uh, issues and matters. And uh, so, again, there was some, some controversy surrounding this bill. And I think it's of interest more broadly than just those who are from Salt Lake because the concern is um, that has been expressed by, by folks outside of Salt Lake is that, well, is this sort of a, a precedent setting bill or, or a continuation perhaps in other bills that already set the precedent where we're going to have some, um, some issues that are going to be further micromanaged at the state level. And so, you know, the, the specifics of this bill uh, relate to how an owner initiated process has to function and what the threshold numbers of property owners that consent to having a historic district established what they are. Uh, and so there's some of the requirements here I'll go over. The bill itself had additional requirements. I didn't want to put them all up there, uh, particularly since the specifics of this one only apply to Salt Lake, but here, here's a broad overview. Uh, as an initial matter, 33% of the property owners had to agree in writing for the creation or the imposition of the historic district. The city had to give some information to prepare and give some neutral information to the property owners uh, before this happens. And then they have to give some additional neutral information to voters when they have a vote, before they have a vote. So all the property owners have a chance to vote as to whether or not they want this historic district. And two thirds, at least two thirds of the property owners that represent at least half of all the parcels or units uh, in the proposed historic district have to vote in favor of having the historic district. There's a provision in this bill that allows the legislative body to override the vote by a two-thirds majority. There's also some provisions in here that relate to uh, time bars to trying to reassert or reimpose a historic district on the same general area where the voters already turned down having uh, a local uh, a historic district imposed. So again, I think this bill is, is uh, of interest uh, as much for the, um, you know, the involvement of the legislature in, uh, in a local land use issue as it is for the specifics of the bill itself. So um, that's, uh, that's that one. All right, the next one we're looking at is House Bill 232, Scenic Byway Amendments, sponsored by uh, Representative Mike Noel. And our understanding that is that uh, the impetus behind this one is that, as you're aware, there are many scenic byways throughout Utah, um, and there are restrictions about what types of signs, if any, can be placed along these byways. 
uh, the concern that's arisen, and apparently there's a, there's a process in, in place to go through legislative bodies uh, to allow segmentation of these scenic byways. So in other words, where there are towns with retail properties, uh, business owners who want to put up signs, Current, you know, being designated as a scenic byway makes it really difficult, if not impossible, to do that in these towns. So the thinking is, well, let's segment off the non-scenic portions of these byways and then make it easier for these business owners to erect signs and advertise for their businesses. Um, and it sounds like there was a process in place. There is a process in place for doing that, but it's more onerous and difficult. And so what this does is create an easier or more streamlined process for segmenting off um, the portion of the scenic byways where a property owner essentially petitions to the uh, Utah State Scenic Byway Committee. There's a committee that uh, works with these byways and kind of tries to preserve this, the scenic nature of them, as I understand it. Um, and so they can appeal or they can petition the committee and the committee um, is required, as I understand it, to uh, go ahead and segment off these non-scenic portions, but the committee also has the ability to appeal to an administrative law judge um, in cases where they feel like the, the section that's requested to be segmented uh, is scenic and should not be segmented. Um, so this, as I understand it, and as stated by the, the sponsor of the bill, was largely a consensus bill. It came up last year, but didn't quite make it through the process. It was one of the last bills on the floor to not be, uh, that was being considered but not passed. And so it came back this year, um, and this year it did pass to provide that option to communities along scenic, by, scenic byways to have uh, an additional option for segmenting for, uh, so that the local business owners can erect signs and, and have that ability. As Jordan mentioned, this this was a bill that uh, arose last year as well. And initially, in the first uh, first drafting of it, the lead attorney and the ombudsman, the Office of the Property Rights Ombudsman is going to be the individual who is going to determine whether or not the uh, proposed uh, portion of the highway to be segmented was scenic or not. And uh, Brent Bateman, the, the lead attorney, had a great time you know, mentioning to anybody who listened that I'm colorblind, you know, I probably don't, probably don't want me doing this. So, um, anyway, yeah, this, as Jordan said, this was, this was a bill that came back. So, okay. So HB 318, Point of the Mountain Development Commission Act. Uh, another high profile matter that's uh, been at the legislature the last little while is the relocation of the state prison. And that has brought up the fact that there's going to be a, a large chunk of property that will now become developable that's in a, a fairly uh, developed area already and also located in an area that is uh, growing very rapidly there around the point of the mountain, just more broadly speaking. And the legislature decided that it would be a good idea to have a development commission created that would have um, stakeholders uh, join this commission, so various people from municipalities and jurisdictions around the point of the mountain, as well as others, to come together and look at uh, various infrastructure, other planning type of, of, of things to try to have a good uh, idea of what would make sense if this area develops. To try to get it done right instead of a more of a piece in a more of a piecemeal situation. The legislature put their money where their, their mouth was on this one, and they allocated uh, about $800,000 to this bill. You know, they, I think showing that they're, they're really serious about um, trying to do, you know, have, have the development there in this area of the state that is growing very rapidly, uh, done well, have it be thought out. At the same time, this bill does clarify that it does not impede or, or in any way preempt the local jurisdiction's land use authority on private property. So they, they did not preempt anything with this bill, but they're just trying to get a, um, you know, a, more of a, a, a plan in place or a process in place through which people can plan for things that will impact multiple jurisdictions like infrastructure and, and general allocations of, of um, 
of building pipes and etc. So that's um, that's HB 318. This one will be uh, of interest to planners and community development directors, economic development directors. Uh, this is kind uh, of the state of the state, one of the first of the that I know of. I know of regional planning, state sponsored regional planning in an area. Um, and so it'll kind of set a precedence, either hopefully good, we'll see, right, about uh, how you can bring communities together uh, to plan regionally and to consider what other municipalities are doing and hopefully produce an outcome that's beneficial uh, to the region. Um, if it goes well, who knows, we might see more of it. If it doesn't go well, we, we probably won't, but it's definitely something of interest to the planning community uh, and anyone involved with that uh, with that industry um, to see how it goes and, and what comes of it. So, uh, the, the anything else? Nope. Oh, no. The next one we're looking at is Senate Bill 169, Olean Walker Housing Loan Fund Amendments. Uh, so, um, the land use portion of this bill is pretty specific. Generally speaking, the bill, uh, the Olean Walker Housing Loan Fund um, is basically put in place to help mitigate homelessness. And the thrust of the bill is to uh, give the board governing the, the loan some flexibility uh, in funding and how to use the funds, uh, and also to set priorities for the loan fund. Uh, but as far as the, the land use portion of it is concerned, uh, it, it, it's a very short provision that says a municipality may not adopt or enforce an ordinance or other regulation that prohibits a homeless shelter from operating year-round. So it's very specific, very clear. Uh, apparently there was one municipality in Utah who does this, that does this, that prohibits a homeless shelter from operating year-round. And the sponsor of the bill, uh, Mr. Weiler, determined that that was uh, sufficient to preempt and, and make sure it doesn't happen in any other communities uh, to, to mitigate the effects of homelessness and to provide those resources to homeless people year-round. Uh, but that's kind of uh, an additional uh, foray into um, the state telling what local jurisdictions can do, some keep in mind that uh, if a, a, an elected official or a resident uh, thinks it might be a good idea to uh, prohibit a homeless shelter in your community from operating year-round, state statute now says they cannot do that. So, Okay, SB 177, Nighttime Highway Construction Noise Amendments. So on this one, basically UDOT gets a free pass to work all night long on certain highways, certain state roads, without having to worry about any noise restrictions that may be in place in, in local jurisdictions. And it, there's sort of a two-tiered approach here. The first one relates to roads that have a posted speed limit of 55 miles per hour or higher, and there they just get a blanket exemption. So, you know, that's... Uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that, that's what the first part here. The second part is if there are roads with a posted speed limit of below 55 miles per hour, they can get an exemption, but they have to meet certain requirements. And they have to, the, the bill, you know, goes through these more in specifics. Um, you know, don't need to go through them all right now, but they have to make some determinations as to weighing the benefit that UDOT's gonna get, basically from being able to work 24-7 uh, without having to worry about the noise restrictions versus the burden that that would thereby impose on the surrounding community. And so that's an analysis that would have to happen. And this bill also does, in any event, still require UDOT, if, if practical, um, to work with local jurisdictions on the noise issue uh, in the pre-construction uh, phase here of their projects. So, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, certainly a bill that UDOT is uh, happy to have, um, you know, how this plays out in terms of residents being bothered by an increase in noise. You know, we'll see, we'll see how many people this ends up affecting. 
and whether there's a, a noticeable difference in how UDOT ends up going about their construction projects at nighttime. So, all right, so that uh, that wraps up the uh, past bills that were related to uh, land use and property rights. Um, now we're going to get a little into the failed bills. We feel like some of the good reasons for talking about the failed bills are some of them may come back, um, and so it'll be good to know that they're coming and, and prepare for them, uh, provide any input to stakeholders if you feel like that might be important. And then a lot of them sent messages uh, to um, local governments, for good or for bad, about uh, you know what certain legislatures legislators think is okay or not okay, or what they feel like are important issues to bring up. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about that as we move through uh, the failed bills and and maybe some messages that were sent, lessons learned type things. Uh, the first one is House Bill 115, beekeeping modifications. Anyone who followed this one knows that it created quite the buzz in the media. That's <laughs> you said you weren't going to do it, Jack. That, that was my attempt at being funny. So, uh, there were a number of articles written about this in the Salt Lake Tribune, Deseret News, local newspapers. Um, it, it sounds like, and as I understand it, uh, there were a number of cases where, uh, reported cases anyways, where local jurisdictions were outright prohibiting beekeeping in certain instances. Uh, so the response it produced was this bill, uh, basically saying that uh, the proposal was in the bill that uh, local governments would be prohibited from regulating beekeeping altogether. Um, it's important to note with this bill that it did not go to the Land Use Task Force. And those who are familiar with the Land Use Task Force, um, it's, uh, I, I think it's kind of uh, uh, Jody Hoffman um, coordinates a lot of it with the League of Cities and Towns. And it's, it's comprised of stakeholders from private sector, public sector, as well as decision makers and the Property Rights Coalition. Uh, in the interim, they try to take land use issues and, and produce some consensus, uh, propose um, potential bills uh, that convey that consensus. Uh, and in the past couple of years, the past several years, it's been a, a good avenue through which uh, people with concerns about land use or property rights issues can get together and talk about the issues and, and, and bring a bill to the legislature that everyone, that all the stakeholders are comfortable with. Um, this one did not go that route. There were a number of bills this year that, that bypassed the Land Use Task Force. Um, so maybe the lesson there is if you feel like there's a, a potential, uh, you know, conflict in your community that, that would uh, benefit from that vetting in the task force, to become familiar with the task force and, and use that resource uh, so that we don't get knee-jerk reactions, right, where uh, there's a perception that um, a community is outright prohibiting beekeeping, and so the reaction is, okay, well, we won't let, we'll take away local authority, we'll take away local uh, jurisdiction, and, and say, you just can't do that. Um, so I guess the cautionary tale is to, to look at your ordinances, see if there are certain hobbies or popular land uses that are outright prohibited and determine whether or not they should be outright prohibited. Maybe they could be allowed, and then you implement standards to uh, mitigate um, a potential detrimental impact, something like that, uh, just something to look at. Ultimately, it did fail uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, there was also a requirement in the bill that uh, beekeepers wouldn't have to register with the state anymore. And there was a lot of concern uh, that if there was a disease outbreak among the bees that uh, that list of registered beekeepers it would, was a good resource or is a good resource to notify beekeepers of that so they can take proper measures. Uh, you know, so, so for several reasons the bill failed, but um, it may be back in some form uh, next session um, if you know people continue to feel like outright prohibiting beekeeping in communities is not appropriate for uh, local governments to do. And uh, the, the next bill here, HB 132, local government licensing amendments. Um, you know, there, there's a concern that there, 
this bill addresses the concern that uh, local governments were able to stop too many home-based businesses from operating through their licensing um, uh, and, and fees that they were doing there in for again for home-based businesses uh, this bill did not pass this time uh, very well maybe back and so it, it does have a, a relation to the land use uh, part of you know what's allowed in residential areas, what's allowed for uh, you know home-based businesses to do, and this is just another way of, of you know getting at whether or not there's uh, too much regulation uh, on those home-based businesses. So we'll we'll see what uh, what comes out of this. And as, as Jordan mentioned, if this is something that ends up going through the land use task force. Um, in this interim session, so. Yeah, and part of what the bill did uh, was it created a fee waiver for low impact uh, businesses. Apparently the concern is there are some communities out there that have uh, burdensome uh, licensing fees. So maybe you have someone who's sitting at a computer doing online marketing in their home. Um, there's a con There was concern that why am, why am I being charged $500? I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, a, a large fee uh, for something that doesn't have an impact, really doesn't need to be regulated, where that was the same fee charged for for a business that maybe had a few trucks on the property and an on-site employee. Um, and so what it sought to do was, was potentially create fee waivers for what are considered more low-impact business businesses, home-based businesses. Uh, so... Um, there is there is uh, thinking out there that this one will likely be back, um, and if, if you want to take a proactive approach, you might review your home-based business fees and determine whether or not uh, you know you should create certain criteria or different um, tiers uh, for the home-based businesses and charge uh, appropriate fees accordingly for lower or higher impact. Um, uh, home-based businesses, and that might reduce some of the perceived concern uh, among those individuals uh, in the communities. Um, anything else on that one? The next one we're looking at that, that didn't pass uh, was House Bill 360, Land Use Amendments, um, and that was sponsored by Representative Mel Brown. This one, uh, what, what Mr. Brown um, proposed, uh, his stated intent was to require greater accountability to the state code and transparency of local decisions. Um, there's a provision in the state LUDMA that talks about how the state statute in most cases um, sets a, ba uh, a baseline and local jurisdictions can enact stricter requirements or higher standards um, in their local ordinances. And as a threshold matter, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that's a problematic provision uh, because it's hard to interpret, right? More or less everything that a local government does is going to be um, arguably a stricter requirement or a higher standard unless the state code, you know, explicitly doesn't allow that. Um, and what Mr. Brown was proposing was that any time a land use ordinance enacted a stricter requirement or a higher standard, uh, that the local government would be required to comply with addition, excuse me, additional noticing requirements. Um, and I think the way the discussion went was, well, how, you know, that, again, um, mostly in every instance that a local government passes an ordinance, it's going to be arguably a higher standard or a stricter requirement um, and so there was the belief that, well, this is just going to produce a lot of litigation because of arguing about what is a higher requirement or a, or a higher standard or a stricter requirement. Um, needless to say, the bill didn't pass, uh, but it is important to keep in mind that uh, people are concerned about property rights, and anytime you're enacting an ordinance, consider what implications that uh, ordinance will have and uh, whether or not that's a consideration to make when passing an ordinance, so. HB 409, the short-term rental amendments. This was another uh, big bill here this session. 
uh, that while did not pass this session is absolutely coming back. And this is going to be a big topic of discussion and work during this interim session. Certainly with the rise of Airbnb and similar type services, lots of probably most every municipality or, or county in the state has short-term rentals in, within their borders, within their jurisdiction. And uh, this bill would have come in and just completely prohibited any prohibition um, or any prevention of having short-term rentals. And um, there was an agreement that this would, uh, that the sponsor would go ahead and, 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 and this bill would be shelved just for the moment uh, so that during this interim session, stakeholders could get together and work on this bill. Um, again, this one is absolutely coming back and it's something that uh, to the extent you'd like to have any sort of input, you know, get, get in touch with, um, with you know, the, the league or the, you know, the, the, uh, the county folks, whoever it is that, uh, you know, that would be representing, um, you know, your, your particular viewpoints and get involved in the discussions that, that are, are absolutely gonna be happening here in the interim. Um, I think the sense is, is that, uh, you know, this is, this is a major issue and it's, you know, it's going to be hard uh, to, to completely prohibit, you know, short-term rentals. Um, again, so, people are very concerned about property rights and about the, the ability of property owners to um, go ahead and, and, and use their property in ways that, that they would like. And uh, this, is, this bill is one manifestation of that, of that concern. So. Hey, Jim. Yeah, it's, it's been, Clarify that. The, oh, someone's saying something. Hey, Jim, um, could I just clarify? Is that kind of? Are we looking at the Airbnb? Is that a short-term rental? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that that it's not just for Airbnb. It's for any type of short-term rental. But it's those kinds of of, uh, of services that you know are the, are the big players. Short-term um, rentals are typically oh, short. It's typically addressed at anybody that is renting for less than 30 days is the general idea. But uh, most of the platforms are going to be like an Airbnb as opposed to just a, you know, but it is opposed to just a private owner doing a one-off deal all completely on their own. But it, it doesn't matter what mechanism they use to do it. This is addressed at anybody renting for less than 30 days is the general. Great. Thank you. Know. you. Appreciate the clarification. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be especially important to those 15 to 20 tourist communities uh, or so. I don't know. There Maybe there's more. I, that was one estimate, 15 to 20 or so tourist communities where this is a real big issue. Um, there are There is a real big market for short-term rentals. Uh, so it would be important for those community and any communities uh, who have an interest to contact your legislators or contact uh, the stakeholders and, and share what. The local jurisdictions concerns are what types of concerns you're getting from residents neighbors of these short-term rentals uh, to try to hopefully produce standards that will be uh, amenable to those who operate the short-term rentals and also be good for the communities and make sure that that they don't become nuisances or or other uh, create other problems uh, unforeseen problems so um, the next bill is, is uh, House Bill 413, Falconry Amendments, and uh, you can imagine this one ruffled a lot of feathers. <laughs> That's the only other joke I have, sorry. Um, and I stole that one actually from the, uh, the sponsor of the bill, Jeremy Peterson, but um, essentially this one sounds like it was, again, another one of those uh, message bills. It was a specific situation with a specific community in northern Utah. Um, where there was a, a falconer who felt like the city was trying to impose uh, burdensome, overly burdensome requirements on the keeping of falcons. Um, and, uh, you know, in the committee hearings, there were representatives from both sides. And it sounds like it may have just been largely a miscommunication on both sides of a lack, that there was a lack to, to uh, cooperate, you know, the the people on the falconry side thought that the city was just going to move forward without listening to anyone. And so that's why they approached a legislator about preempting it at the state level. Um, but at, at the same time, it sounds like the, the local government was interested in, in trying to work out a compromise. So I think that I, I believe that's where it ended is they were going to get together and try to work out a local compromise as opposed to uh, the need for a statewide remedy. Um, 
that said, you know, looking at different hobbies in your community, if, if uh, local uh, requirements are over, appear to be low, overly burdensome, it may be wise to create some reasonable standards to allow these types of hobbies and, and sports um, and, uh, and make everyone happy in that regard. So that, that's another one. So HB 414 zoning amendments, uh, this one specifically uh, said that it is not appropriate to run a business in a residential area. And the purpose of this bill was to try to get recovery residences from being able to happen in residential areas. And this raises a whole host of, uh, of concerns and potential problems with the Americans with Disabilities Act and with the Fair Housing Act federal laws that preempt any sort of state action. There's lots of litigation on these laws. They, they're, it's a highly regulated field and area. And I think that uh, the, the legislature ended up just not wanting to go there and passing any law that could make uh, anyone feel like they had the ability to circumvent or to not comply with any of these uh, federal requirements in looking at any type of group home setting. So I, I think it remains to be seen if this one comes back, but I think the, the general view was that this is just a really tough area of law and it's, it's not, um, you, have to, you have to tread very carefully as you're moving forward with this because of all the litigation and the case law and, and the federal laws that, that preempt a lot of what local jurisdictions can do in this type of setting, so. And I think our, our advice to anyone who's presented with a, a residential treatment facility and there is a dispute, especially as it relates to anything like a reasonable accommodation request, um, almost inevitably you'll want to bring in legal counsel, experienced legal counsel to navigate those types of requests um, because, you know, throughout the, the country, uh, local jurisdictions have really got uh, hammered when they've not followed the law in in relation to these these facilities so um, the last one we have on the docket is uh, Senate Bill 92 water conservation amendments um, this is, was sponsored by Scott Jen Jenkins um, or Jenkins I think um, in the Senate uh, this is a big issue and it's not going away for a long time um, initially he was proposing that uh, he was proposing prohibiting cities and towns from requiring uh, grass in commercial and industrial zones. Um, he ultimately ended up coordinating with stakeholders, Utah League of Cities and Towns and other interested parties, and it was amended to uh, uh, not require more than 5% of a property to be landscaped with vegetation. Um, and then that was the last proposed bill. Uh, ultimately, it failed, um, but but clearly this is a big issue in Utah right now with our growing population. I, I, I'm, a, I'm aware of many local jurisdictions who already have or are working on uh, water-wise landscaping requirements, allowing zero escaping, requiring less grass. Um, this obviously isn't as big of an issue in, in the southern portion of the state where all that is already allowed and encouraged and expected. Um, but as you move for, farther north, there are a lot of ordinances out there that require large amounts of grass and vegetation that are very water hungry environments. Um, and as our communities continue to grow in the arid state of Utah, uh, water is going to become, it's gonna move higher and higher on the list of priorities. Um, and so, uh, you know, looking at your ordinances and making adjustments to allow for, you know, attractive water wise landscaping is definitely a good idea uh, moving forward. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. That's the presentation that we had today. Of course, as always, we're happy to continue any conversation that we, we start here with anyone uh, that would like to continue it. Feel free to give us a call. We're happy to help with other types of uh, land use, eminent domain, takings issues that you may have. And uh, just, uh, again, we're, we're here to try to help uh, help resolve uh, disputes and conflicts and uh, help people know what the law is and comply with it. So thanks, uh, thanks again uh, for, for having us here, Jason, and uh, the trust, and uh, Brent, appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you so much.
uh, hopefully, hopefully we <laughs> you can hear me there. Um, it, folks, if you've got any questions, you can type those into the chat box. I did have one question that came in, and that was if if uh, you'd be willing to make the slides available. Oh yeah, sure. You bet. Yeah, so we will. For the low, low price of no special price. No, you you got them, Jason. Send them out. Yeah, we will send the send the slides out when we send out the notice that the webinar recording is available. Um, we are recording the session, and and we'll uh, send that out uh, as soon as it's posted up to our website, which uh, could be later today. We'll see how quick we can get that posted. So, um, just looking for any questions there. I don't see any coming in. That was a great uh, great roundup of of uh, things I hadn't heard of. Of several of those, so that so we really appreciate uh, giving us that information, uh, so we can make some good decisions out there. Thanks, folks. Appreciate all of the uh, all of your attendance, and uh, look forward to seeing you again the next time we uh, next time we do this. Everybody, go out and have a great day. <laughs>